Welcome everyone to our next session for the Sweet Next High School Leadership Academy. Uh, it is how to make dollars make sense, um, how to navigate the financial aid process with Tina Steele. If you have not already done so, please make sure that you complete the pre-event survey that you see on the screen right now. If you're like, I don't have that link, grab that QR code on the left, on the right hand side at the bottom and go ahead and finish uh, uh, that pre-event survey real quick. And then I'm gonna go ahead and move us to the next slide slide in five, four, three, two, and one. If you don't know, now you know. I am Marquita Riley, the Outreach and Student Programs Manager for Sweet HQ, and I'm here to not only be your illustrious host of the evening, I'm also going to make sure that we recognize a few people that have been able to get this program up and running, and that is our Sheila sponsors. Motorola Solution Foundation, General Motors, Amateur Radio Digital Communications, Akamai Foundation, and Turner Construction. Most of you all have had uh, some sort of interaction whether it's through Sweet Next Connect or through a session that you attended. So we just want to show them some love in that chat and thank them so much for everything that they do because without them, we would not be able to put on this program right here in your homes globally. So thank you so much. Um, some of you all have heard me say this again. Some of y'all pronounce Sheila, Shyla. Some of y'all pronounce it something else. So it is formally pronounced Sheila. It is a Sweet Next High School Leadership Academy. It is an engaging virtual year round program uh, where we host three week long summits. Um, some of you all might be familiar of the former framework where it was a one day live session, but we have been blessed enough uh, and we are grateful that we have been able to grow this program uh, for over 328 students that have been accepted. Uh, uh, to be able to do three week long summits. And what do we do here at Sheila? We build self confidence and resilience amongst high school students that are interested in an engineering and technology degree. We provide them with multiple opportunities to network with peers, mentors, role models, and industry professionals, which we know that is key to your success in the, in the industries that you're looking to do. Um, again, we highlight five key program um, tracks that are basically something that we figured is going to help you all become a more well-rounded, well tongue tie there, well-rounded <laughs> student. Uh, we highlight college preparation, STEM pathways, leadership, self-development, and cultural awareness and inclusion. So those are all the things that we found um, as you guys are developing your STEM identity uh, on what helps you be successful. So again, we deliver this through two learning modalities. So that's live, which is what you're participating in now, or for some of you all, you're participating on demand, watching the recording after the session is completed. We have this available through our Google Classroom as well as our Sweet Next TV YouTube channel um, under the Sheila playlist. And all sessions have a Google takeaway assignment. Um, so what we did super special for this year, FY22, is that you can complete 10 takeaway assignments and you receive a certificate of completion. And you know how I stress the importance of building that for portfolio. So make sure that you are completing those assignments. I know some of you all have asked how many you've completed so far. Keep that energy. I'd love to see you all complete all of them, but at least 10 is what qualifies you for a certificate of completion. And it also grants you access to our graduation ceremony on April 21st. All right. So you know what's next. We're hopping right on into tonight's speaker for the evening. She is phenomenal uh, and a special woman because not only is she someone that is very knowledgeable about all things FAFSA uh, and learning how to figure out how to do financial aid, what is all of these pieces that takes it to, that takes you to the next level and gets you that money, 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 money. You want that, right? Everybody wants a little funding that hopefully they don't have to pay back <laughs> like I do, student loan. Absolutely. So she is going to help you through that process, being a mother who has put her children through school uh, and really is self-taught at that. She's going to give you all the things that you need to know, all the pieces that you need to know in order for you to be successful in figuring out the FAFSA process. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Ms. Tina Steele. Thank you so much, Marquita, for that wonderful introduction. And I'm so happy to be here to talk with you all about financial aid and, and how you can pay for college. I think it's great that I have 
uh, a ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade students here because it's never too early to get prepared for financial aid. So we're going to cover a lot of information tonight and we'll take a number of breaks and I'll be sure to answer all of your questions along the way. But before we get started, I want to just let you know the exact things that we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to go over all the different types of financial aid that are available to you to help you pay for college. We're going to talk about preparing for the FAFSA and CSS profile, and I'm going to make sure you know what those forms are. They're both a really important part of the financial aid process. I'm going to talk about how a financial aid offer is determined, a timeline of the financial aid process. We'll, I'll actually do a little breakdown of a financial aid award letter so you can kind of get an idea of what that might look like, what you can do to ensure getting the best financial aid offers possible, and then lastly, what you can do if you're not awarded enough financial aid. And just to give you a little bit of background about me, I have worked in the college financial aid field for over 30 years, and I've assisted thousands of students and parents navigate the overwhelming financial aid process. I left my career about seven years ago and founded the FAFSA Guru because I saw a really big gap between the needs of uh, that were out there and available families to help them navigate this process. And it's been wonderful. And I've actually, I, I enjoy it. I work with students all across the United States. I'm also mom and stepmom of six children, two college graduates, two who are currently currently in college and I also have a high school senior and a high school sophomore. So I've kind of been on both sides of the equation for sure. So what I'm going to do first is talk to you about the different types of financial aid that are available. As a student in high school, when you're kind of thinking about college, I know financial aid is probably one of the, the last things that's on your mind because you're more focused on where you want to go to school, what you want to study and doing all that research. But financial aid is a really important part of the process. So educating yourselves now about what that means for you and what it's going to look like for your family is going to help you be really prepared when the time comes. So there are essentially four types of financial aid. There's federal and state aid, institutional aid, private outside scholarships, and then alternative private education loans. And I'm just going to go through each one of these one by one. So with federal and state financial aid, this is the type of aid that you're applying for when you fill out the FAFSA. The free application for federal student aid is a form that you fill out every single year to apply for money to help you pay for college. You fill it out along with your parents. The different types of aid that are available by filling this form out come in several forms. It comes in grants, which are free, depending on your family's income. And as far as grants, I do have them listed here. There's a federal Pell Grant that you can qualify for of up to about 60. It's actually going to be about $6,500 for the upcoming year, which is free money. You don't have to pay back if your family falls within a certain income. There's also an SEOG grant, which ranges anywhere from $100 to $4 thousand dollars a year depending on how much family income you have and then state grants which vary but are typically around fifteen hundred dollars a year depending on the state that you live in so those are free sources of aid that you do not have to pay back but you do have to fill out the FAFSA to be considered for them in addition to grants, you might be eligible for something known as federal work study. And I don't know if you've heard about this or not, but what this allows you to do is get a job working on campus in one of the departments hiring work study students and you can earn a paycheck for the work that you do. So it's nice to it's nice to use for like incidentals in a part-time job. The great thing about work study is you can work your hours around your schedule. And if you don't have any work to do, you can actually do your homework, which is why they call it federal work study. So you may also see a federal work study award in your financial aid offer. And then lastly, with the FAFSA, the other things that you might be eligible for are in the form, the other types of aid, aid I should say, is in the form of student loans. There's a federal direct student loan that you're going to qualify for as a first year student. You can take this loan out every single year that you're in school and it increases with the year that you're in school. So as a first year student, you could borrow $5,500 and as a second year student, $6,500. And then as a third and fourth year student, $7,500. 
Now, this is a loan the government offers. It's guaranteed. It's not based on credit. It's a low interest loan. No payments come due on this loan until after you graduate. So while I'm not a big proponent of getting into significant loan debt when you go to college, if you're going to borrow any loans, this federal direct student loan is definitely a good one to borrow. So as I mentioned, uh, it doesn't come due until after you graduate, about six months. And if your parent applies for a parent loan in their own name and is denied for credit reasons, then you can actually get awarded more money in this federal direct student loan. So just kind of a little tip for you to know. Um, some, when that time comes, your financial aid administrator would make sure that you are aware of that. And then the last type of aid that you might be eligible for as a result of filling out the FAFSA Excuse me, I might have to mute myself from time to time. I have a little bit of cough I'm struggling with. Um, is a Federal Parent PLUS loan. So this is a loan that your parent can actually take out on your behalf to help pay for your education. They can borrow the total cost of attendance of the college minus any minus your expected family contribution. So essentially what that means is any financial aid gap you owe after you receive your financial aid award, your parent could borrow that through a Federal Parent PLUS loan if they choose to. Again, it's a loan in your parent's name and in order for them to borrow this, you do have to fill out the FAFSA form. So when you hear you know, everybody talking about FAFSA, financial aid, these are the the four different types of aid, the uh, free grants, the federal work study, the federal direct student loan, and the federal parent plus loan is what you're applying for when you fill out the FAFSA form. Now, keep in mind, this is only one piece of financial aid, remember, because as I mentioned before, there's also something known as institutional aid. So institutional financial aid is like a whole separate pool of money that colleges have based on how well endowed they are, or like if it's a private college versus a public college. And then sometimes they require a supplemental financial aid form that you have to fill out in order to be, ter to, to be determined how much of this institutional aid you're going to get. So institutional aid always comes in the form of scholarships. It would be through need-based scholarships. So you're never going to see like a loan through institutional aid or anything like that or a grant. It's always an institutional scholarship. So there are two types of institutional aid, and you may have heard of this. There's the merit-based aid and need-based aid. So when I say merit-based, that's based on your academics. When you get ready to apply to college and you fill out those admissions applications, they're going to be looking at your GPA and test scores, if your SAT or ACT scores, if the college requires them. And then they're going to award you with a merit scholarship based on that information. So one of the best things that you can be doing right now while you're in high school is be really focused on your academics and keep that GPA up there. It can make a difference of, of thousands of dollars when that time comes for you to get awarded that merit scholarship. So there's the merit-based and then there's the need-based, which is going to be based on your family's financial circumstances and how much income you earn. Something that a lot of students aren't aware of is how significantly financial aid offers can vary from college to college. So you could apply to seven different colleges with all with similar price tags, let's say 50 or $60,000, and then get very different financial aid packages across the board, depending on how well endowed some colleges are, how much institutional aid they have to offer and what their income cutoffs and things like that are. So it's something that you just really, really wanna be prepared for. And one of the ways to do that is to really keep those grades up now while you're in school so that you can ensure getting the best merit scholarships to help close that financial aid gap. The third type of financial aid is outside scholarships. And when I get through the fourth type of financial aid, we'll take a little break and I'll answer some questions if you have any. Now, this is another area where all of you could actually be focused on right now as high school students. There are literally thousands of outside scholarships out there. 
And I see students leave money on the table all the time when it comes to searching and applying for these. There's not one universal form to fill out like the FAFSA form. Scholarships are offered by organizations and there's a separate application for each one. They all have different deadlines, but there are scholarships out there for students who are ages 13 and older. So every single, every one of you watching this webinar can actually be applying for scholarships right now and securing them for college. What happens a lot of times is I get seniors or parents of high school seniors that come to me that last year and they haven't been searching and applying for these outside scholarships. So I'm just wanna, I can't encourage you enough to do that, to make sure that that's something that you're focused on now. And I'll give you some tips for doing that and kind of tell you what I find most successful when it comes to students receiving these. So the different types of scholarships that are available, there are so many STEM scholarships out there, which is great. That's the most common scholarship out there and you're all studying STEM. So you actually have a 30% better chance of receiving scholarships than other students just because of the field of study that you're in. There are scholarships based on merit, which would be your grades and test scores. They're based on financial need, academic major, your abilities, the state you live in, your athletic ability, disability. There's scholarships for everything. I'm, when I say thousands, I mean thousands of scholarships. It's just, you have to know where to look. It can be a little bit tedious scholarship searching and that's where students tend to get a little bit overwhelmed. So the first, the first thing I always recommend is to set up a system to stay organized with the scholarship search process. So if none of you have started this yet, then I'm going to give you some tips for doing this. The first is to set up a separate email. And I actually have this listed as a little activity for all of you because I encourage everybody to do this right now on their computer, open up their Gmail and create a separate email specifically for scholarship searching. And the reason I say this, you'll notice as you start doing this that you're going to get a lot of emails. You're going to get spammed. You do not want your personal inbox to get spammed. And the other thing is you don't wanna use like a high school uh, email address or anything like that. You want a separate email that's going to carry on with you after high school that you can use while you're in college. And you want to use that. What, what most students do is set up an email that their parents can access to. Maybe they call it their last name and family or something. And then everybody has the login information. That way, if parents are helping search for scholarships also, they can use the same email. And then you're getting notifications at this email and everything's kind of coming to this one address and your personal inbox is not getting spammed. So I do have this listed as a little activity. I encourage you all to set up a separate Gmail now because one of my goals at the end of this workshop is for you to have a little system organized and a spreadsheet ready to go. So as you're searching for these scholarships, you can put them into your spreadsheet and you can begin applying for them. Whoever has completed this activity um, will receive a $25 gift card. If you jump in that chat and let me know that you have started and created your email, and if you feel comfortable, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that didn't take long. <laughs> That's good. That's awesome. All right. Uh, ooh, I, my eyes. I tried to grab the first one. Who, Renee? Renee, you got. Nice. I'm gonna. Do, I'm gonna do two. Okay, I'm gonna do two because I actually had, um, Renee and um, Shreya. You also did it, but you DM'd me instead of <laughs> putting it in for everyone. So you two got. Uh, you two have twenty five dollar gift cards. Thank you for getting that done. I love that energy. Awesome. That's great, guys. Really gonna be helpful for you for sure. Okay, so let's talk about consistency with scholarship searching. You know, it really is kind of like not a part time job, but you should spend a good hour a week to an hour and a half every week searching and applying for scholarships. And I know you're all busy in school, you might be involved with sports, you know, rigorous course loads and things like that. But let's talk about how much time we all spend on our phones. So if you, what I say to students, especially in high school, because it can get overwhelming and tedious, is to chunk the time. So what I mean by that is 
pick up your phone for 20 minutes and do some scholarship searching. And then as you find scholarships, funnel them into your spreadsheet. And then on another day that week, go back in for another 20 minutes, do some searching, find some more, put them in your spreadsheet. And then maybe for the last 20 or 30 minutes that you log in, you actually apply for one or two scholarships. So if you break it up like that, it's really not that bad and you will get into a groove, I promise, and you're going to become a, a pro at applying for scholarships. What I recommend is applying for a minimum of three to five scholarships each and every month if you can. I mean, at the very minimum, two, but I say aim for three to five. And scholarships are something that you should be searching for year round. So the way that it works is scholarships for the following year. So all the scholarships for 22, 23, if any of you are going to be starting school next fall, started opening in August. Now every month there's new scholarships opening up. January through April is the busiest scholarship deadline season of the year. So if you haven't started searching and applying for them yet, that's okay. You're actually, it's really good timing right before the busy season hits and now's the time to get started. So at the very minimum, January through April, you want to be spending this time every week applying for scholarships, but I recommend doing it pretty much August through April or May, if you can. And that's every year in high school. And then again, when you're in college, you can continue searching for scholarships. You'll be surprised at what a difference this can make in closing the financial aid gap. And for many of you, it could mean attending the college that you really want to attend because of that financial aid gap. If you secure enough scholarships, it could make that college within reach financially for you. So again, it is tedious, but it is worth it. I promise you there are uh, so many scholarships out there that you can qualify for. Focus on scholarships that are $5,000 and less. That's another little tip for you. They tend to be less competitive. And when they're less competitive, you have better chances of receiving those. So I have another little activity for you. And this is related to the scholarship. I want you all to start your scholarship spreadsheet. So I'm going to just stop sharing for a minute because I want to show you, I want to show you um, what I'm talking about. Can everybody see this okay? Can you see this okay? Yes. Okay, good. So this is a scholarship spreadsheet and you can create this in a Google Sheet. Most of you are familiar with Google Sheets. I think you all use them. And I prefer Google Sheets because that way, if you have any family members that are helping search for them and you all have access to this sheet, they can go in and add scholarships for you. But I want you to just create a sheet that has six different columns as you can see here. The first column should always be the due date, when the scholarship is due, because you would need to prioritize these and make sure you're completing scholarships by the deadline. The next column is going to be the amount, so you have an idea of how much the scholarship is. The third column would be the scholarship name. The fourth would be the URL, so this is going to be the link where you can apply for the scholarship. And then the fifth column will be a little note section. Maybe you just want to make some notes about this particular scholarship, or maybe you found a scholarship that would be great for you to apply for next year, but the deadline's already gone by. So you can just make a note here, you know, apply for this scholarship next year and you're saving yourself some time next year. And then the last column should just be an applied box. So you can just kind of mark that, check that off when you've applied for the scholarship. This is really the best way to stay organized when you're searching and applying for scholarships. As I mentioned, when you go in each week and, and do your searching, just go to your spreadsheet and put all your scholarships in here that you find that you're eligible for. And then when you have some time, go back later and actually apply for one or two in the order that they're due. So I'm gonna let you all do that. Um, maybe you're working on it now, but just give you a couple of minutes to create your scholarship spreadsheet. And I'll leave this up while you do that. Hey, Tina, while they're doing that, we got a question from Renee wanting okay. to know whether or not bold.org is a legitimate website. She says she applies to different scholarships every day. Yeah, bold.org is, there's, there's a lot of scholarship websites out there, and the best advice I can give to you about applying for scholarships, any worthwhile scholarship 
should take some time and effort to apply for on your part, which means an essay, answering some questions in depth, creating a video. If they're just asking you for some basic information, you know, it's more of a lottery type scholarship where they're just fishing for your email and probably going to spam you. So any scholarship that seems too easy is too easy. It definitely should take a little bit of work on your part, but Bold is um, a reputable scholarship website for sure. There's actually so many, there's uh, so many scholarship resources out there. Scholarships.com is another great website. My Scholly. And I'm gonna just check to make sure we don't have any questions while you're doing that. I think, uh, first of all, they already have finished it. So okay, I'm good. looking at that too, and I'm trying They're to write fast. down a couple. Yeah, very fast. Oh, there is a question. Renee asks, this is off topic, but do you know about um, anything about college advisors? Do I know anything? I do. Yeah. I mean, is there a specific question? I do. I've, I've worked in different departments and colleges and very familiar with. Renee, if you can unmute to specify, that'd be great. But um, I'm going to actually hold your question because I, I like that these are specific to websites. So um, one other one that they asked, is it legit, is scholarship.com. Um, yes. worth it. Um, and also myscolly.com. It's scholarships.com with an S on the end and myscolly.com with two L's. Now, the only thing with my Scott, those are great. My Scully does cost like $7 a month to be a part of, but it, it is worth it. They do have some great resources. So, um, it's one of the only scholarship websites that actually charges. So I, I, um, I want to go back to your question, Renee, go ahead, if you have a specific one about college advisors. Um, there's a website called College Advisor, and they called me multiple times for a consultation and said that they could help me write an application and apply to scholarships and study for the SAT. Okay. And once I... You know, I told them that I don't, because it was quite expensive, and the the list of things they were saying they could help me with, it, it wasn't that much compared to how much they were asking me to pay. Yeah. And, and they stopped contacting me after I didn't, I showed it, stopped showing interest. Yeah, you will get, that's kind of an educational consulting firm. There's a lot of firms out there that will... Uh, reach out to students and try to get them, you know, involved with their services when it comes time, you know, for the admissions process. Now, your high school guidance counselor should be helpful. You may have somebody that's deemed uh, somebody, I'm sure with your organization, you have other people that can help with like the admissions essays and things like that. I College advisor is definitely more of like the educational consulting firm, which is going to cost money. It can cost thousands of dollars to work with any of these educational consulting firms. So I would stick with high school guidance, high school guidance counselors when it comes to getting help with the admissions essay. They're usually really great about doing that at the end of your junior year, getting you started with your college uh, admissions essay. It's a part of a requirement for college guidance offices. Hopefully that helps. Okay, there's one more and then we're gonna go ahead and move on. But okay. um, there is a question um, from Rachel that says, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to catch the first part. What about the National on uh, National Society of High School Scholars? They have a membership fee and have scholarships that members um, can apply for. Uh, but I also have heard of the NSHSS it's, that it's a scam. Um, no, I'm here to tell you it's not a scam because I actually not. Was a member. It's not. It's National not. Honor Society is very reputable, and yeah, it's it's definitely not a scam. That it, it, it's worthwhile for sure. Yeah, a any um, like I said, any it's usually pretty easy to spot scams, which are more like lot that looks it's like a lottery type scholarship you know enter your email to win or be entered to win a ten thousand dollar scholarship or something like that those are the ones that just are not really legitimate does that help rachel was that helpful if you can unmute 
Yeah, it was helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and You're I personally welcome. can attest because I actually was a part of it and um, continued on in college as well. And it is a good resource. If nothing else, you are able to share in the same space with other uh, peer, uh, your other peers, um, and they can also give you a you know a wealth of resources as well. So okay, um, great. Stick with it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, guys, great job on getting that scholarship spread, spreadsheet started. Now I want you to use it as you start searching for these scholarships. So make it a priority. If you haven't done it, you know, if you're a junior or a senior and you're panicking and you're like, oh my gosh, I really haven't started doing that yet. It's okay. It's not too late to get started. Just start doing it now and you could definitely secure some uh, in time for college. So just make a little bit of time each and every week. And if you can have a goal of applying for three to five a month, you'll actually, you'll be doing really well and significantly improve your chances of receiving the scholarships. Um, and then for anybody that might be interested, I do have a digital course, Scholarships 101, on my website. You can check out at thefafsaguru.com. It's more of an in-depth, like, hour-long webinar that will teach you how to effectively search for and find them and provide you with a number of resources. Okay, so the last type of financial aid is what is known as alternative and private education loans. I always say to consider these a last resort, only use them to fill the gap after all other options have been exhausted. So alternative private education loans are not federally funded and they are there and intended to help close the financial aid gap, which means you can borrow as much as you owe in financial aid gap in these loans. However, they're loans that you have to pay back. So before you know it, you can be in a whole lot of debt. And with private loans, the interest rates are higher and the terms are not as great. So I always caution students to be very careful. I mean, if you have like a gap of $20,000 a year, and you're borrowing a loan, by the time you get out, you're looking at $80,000 a year in student loan debt. And that is a lot of money that is going to add up you know, to a lot in monthly payments. So you just wanna be conscious of it. However, alternative and private loans are there and available for you to borrow. It's a loan that the student can take out in their name, in your name. However, it is based on credit. So for most students coming out of high school that don't have credit established, they need a co-signer in order to borrow this loan. So, you know, the pro is, like I said, if you, it'll cover that whole, all of that financial aid gap after financial aid is applied, but the cons are, you know, it's a higher interest rate and you can be in a lot of debt before you know it. So just be really careful when it comes to loans. What I tell all my families to do when I'm working with students and parents, I have a program that I run for um, high school seniors and their parents. And I always say at the very beginning of the year, sit down, talk about your colleges, and then as a family, talk about your bottom line financially. Talk to your parents about what they can afford, what they're willing to afford, and then stick with that number. Because what happens a lot of times is students don't realize how this financial aid works and and you know the financial aid offers come out and they they tend to really want to go to the colleges that aren't not offering the best financial aid packages and then it just becomes it's a really difficult situation for everyone to get into so there's things you can do now to prepare like i'm telling you apply for the outside scholarships and then have those conversations with your parents that senior year about what they can afford that's going to be really important part of the process Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the FAFSA, and then I will, uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the FAFSA, and then a little bit about the CSS profile, and then I'll answer, you know, any questions that you have, unless there's some uh, pressing questions in the meantime while I'm going through this. So as I mentioned before, the FAFSA is the form that you fill out every single year to apply for financial aid. It's called the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It opens up October 1st for the following year. So anybody here that's gonna be starting college in the fall of 22 would be responsible for filling out the FAFSA that just opened in October. You fill it out along with your parents and it's based on prior year income. So your family's 2020 income is going to be reported on this, this form. It needs to be filled out every single year in order for you to get money to help you pay for college. So if I have any seniors in here that have not completed the FAFSA yet, 
I would encourage you that you make this a priority and get this done as soon as possible. The sooner you fill out the FAFSA, the better when it comes to financial aid. So that brings me to this, file early. The earlier you file, the more financial aid you can get. And also a lot of states have their own FAFSA deadlines, which means you have to fill out the FAFSA by a certain deadline in order to be considered for that state grant of the state you live in. So that's really important to know. There are some protected assets on the FAFSA. So just keep this in mind. You're, you know, when you're, um, when this, Time frame comes, it wouldn't apply to you, but it would apply to your parents and you can let them know this. But parents do not have to report the equity of the primary home that they live in or the value of their retirement accounts on the FAFSA. So those are protected assets that the government will not take into consideration. Also, if your parents are divorced or separated, only one parent needs to fill out the FAFSA. This is really important. I see a lot of families make mistakes with this and it can actually cost you financial aid. So your parents do not have to be legally separated. They just have to be separated living in different households. And then the parent with whom you resided with most this last within the last year is the parent who should fill out the FAFSA on your behalf. If they filed a joint tax return with their spouse, they simply separate out their income and assets. So this is important, can make a really big difference when you count one parent's income versus two parents' incomes on the FAFSA. So just wanted to make you all aware of that. And then the FSA ID. This is something that you could all do ahead of time. You will need to create this in order to fill out your FAFSA form. It's a unique username and password. You will complete one and also one parent needs to have their own FSA ID. And you wanna keep it in a very safe place because it's it's a pain if you lose it to go in and reset it. Sometimes it takes longer to do that than actually filling out the FAFSA form. So to create an FSA ID, you can go to this website that's listed right here. This is not an activity you have to do right now, but definitely encourage you to do it um, just to kind of get it created. And go to this website here. And like I said, you create your own and then your parent create their own. Make a note, like a locked note on your phone, write it down and put it in a drawer and don't lose it. You're gonna use that FSA ID every single year that you fill out the FAFSA form. And it's a pain if you lose it. So create your FSA ID, that's the first step. Then you're gonna apply and fill out your FAFSA form where you can list up to 10 colleges on the form. And then shortly after that, what happens is you fill out your FAFSA, it goes to the government for processing, the government sends the results to all the colleges on the FAFSA, and then the financial aid offices at the colleges actually design your financial aid offer and put those together. So if I have any seniors in here um, that are applying early action, early decision, then those financial aid offers tend to come out by mid-December, right about now. And then for students that are applying regular admission deadlines, which are usually January and February, then they'll be notified about financial aid offers in March or April. So that just gives you an idea of the time frame of those. Okay, how are we doing for questions? A lot of information to throw at you. So just wanna make sure before I move on. I think we're okay right now. We're good. You can go ahead and okay. Move. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about the CSS a little bit. If you're not familiar with what this is, you, you should be. So the CSS profile is put out by the college scholarship service, uh, the college board, same place where you will log in to sign up and take your SAT if you haven't already. This is a supplemental financial aid form that some colleges require in order to determine how much institutional aid to offer. So it's a little more in depth than the FAFSA form, and it's going to ask for your family's income and asset information. On the CSS profile, one of the big differences is if your parents are divorced or separated, then both parents typically still need to complete a CSS. Usually there's a custodial CSS and a non-custodial CSS. Now, in order to determine which colleges require this, because not all colleges do, you can do a simple Google search that says colleges that require the CSS profile. 
and it will pull up an alphabetical listing of all of the colleges that require it. It's kind of a good thing when colleges require this because that means that they have some good institutional scholarship money to award, but in order to award it, they want more financial information from you and your family in order to do that. So it's not a bad thing. Um, it actually could work out in your favor, but it's just a little bit more financial aid work on the part of your family. So as far as the CSS, there are deadlines for the FAFSA, there's priority deadlines for the FAFSA and CSS that are always outlined on college websites, especially if you're applying early action and early decision. You want to make sure you're meeting those deadlines. A lot of times those are in November if you're applying early action or early decision. If you don't fill these forms out by the deadline, if you don't fill the CSS out by the deadline, then you actually can miss out on receiving institutional aid. And this could be thousands of dollars in scholarship money. So very, very important that you find out whether or not the college requires it. It opens October 1st, just like the FAFSA does. It is more tedious to fill out. It requires more information. And while the FAFSA is free to complete, the CSS is not. It does cost $25 for the first college and then $16 for each college you submit it to after. However, if your family's income falls within a certain range, they'll automatically apply a waiver at the end so you don't have to pay those fees. I believe it, it depends, It depends. but what I normally see if there's a family income of around $70,000 or less, they tend to qualify for that, the waivers for the um, application fees. So the College Board website is where you want to go to fill this out. You can log in with the same account that you use to create your SAT. And if you haven't already created that, you will your junior year. And that's going to be what you use to log in to fill out the CSS profile. Deadlines. So as I mentioned, it's imperative that you don't miss them because missing them means you can miss out on thousands of dollars in financial aid. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how a financial aid offer is determined. And um, this can be a little confusing. So if you have any, any questions, feel free to holler. But there's a federal methodology that the government does on the FAFSA. And there's also an institutional methodology that the college does on the CSS profile to come up with what's called an expected family contribution, an EFC. Now that's going away within the next couple of years. They're actually replacing that with what's known as the, the Student Aid Index or the SAI. So what the college does is uses that number to determine how much financial need a student has. So they take their cost of attendance. So let's say a college costs $50,000. Your EFC from the FAFSA is $25,000. If you subtract the two, that means that you have a financial need of $25,000. The college then tries to package you with as much need-based aid as possible to meet that $25,000. Doesn't mean that they'll meet all of it. Some colleges will, some colleges won't. It depends again on how much money they have to offer. So that's essentially it in a nutshell. So when you do your FAFSA, You'll find out right away what your expected family contribution is, which will give you an idea of, of what the government expects that your family can contribute towards your education for one year. That's what that EFC number means. It can be kind of scary. In many cases, it can actually be up to a third of a family's annual income, the EFC. So it can be um, a little alarming sometimes when those numbers come out, which is all the more reason to do things early on in high school to get prepared for financial aid. So to determine how much financial aid colleges offer, as you're all out there exploring and looking at colleges, th this is something you can find out. You can actually just Google average financial aid package offered by ABC University. You can go to any college website and search their net price calculator, and you can input your family's financial information. And then the, it'll give you an idea of what your bottom line might be to attend that particular college. That's actually a really great tool. They're, um, the, one, the net price calculators that I think are most 
beneficial are the ones that require more information to, you know, that requires you to fill out more information and not, it doesn't just ask a few basic questions. You know, the more information it asks from you, the more accurate that's going to be. And then the other website I want to give to you and actually show you is collegedata.com. So I'm going to stop sharing and then um, reshare. And I'm just going to show you if you're not already familiar with this website, this is a good one. Can everybody see my screen? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So college data dot com is a really great resource. You don't have to have a profile. You can create a profile, but you don't have to have one to do a general search. But if you come here, you can you can essentially put any college in here. So let's just say you want to look at Boston College. And then it gives you some great information about this college. So it tells you how big it is. It tells you how many men, how many women. It gives you the entrance difficulty, very difficulty. It gives you the overall admission rate, 26% of 29,000 applicants were admitted. Um, it tells you if they offer early action. It tells you what their regular admission deadline is. And then usually it will tell you right here what the average GPA is of students that get admitted. Boston College doesn't do it, but most of the colleges do. And it also tells you what the um, median SAT scores are of students in these different areas based on students that have been admitted. It gives you the cost of attendance. And then right here, see this where it says average percent of need met, 100%. This is always good. So remember when I just talked to you about how a college determines financial need? Remember, they take the cost of attendance, they subtract your EFC, and that meet, that's your financial need. So if your financial need is $25,000, Boston College is saying they will meet 100% of that financial need, which is awesome. Some other colleges might say that they meet 70% of financial need. Some might say 50%. It just depends on the college. It gives you an idea of what the average freshman financial aid award is right here, $46,000, the average indebted, indebtedness of 2018 graduates, so the average student loan debt. So this is another really good way. I mean, there's a lot more information you can get here, but another great way to kind of see how affordable colleges are, but not just that, like how competitive they are as you're building your lists. You know, you want to have your, your A, B, and C colleges, you're really competitive, you're kind of competitive, and then the ones that you know that you're going to have no problem getting into. That's an important part of the process. So just wanted to give you all that as a resource because it's really great. All right, let me get back to where I was. Okay, so financial aid timeline, the first thing that you all should be doing really is applying for scholarships. That's the very first thing that any high school student should be focused on from the time they hit high school, ninth grade, apply for scholarships. And uh, then get your FSA IDs when you're a high school senior, you're gonna get your FSA IDs in September, then you're gonna fill out the FAFSA and CSS profile as soon after October 1st as possible. Watch for possible verification requests. That's just sometimes a process the government um, requires you to go through where you have to provide some supporting documentation to the financial aid office in order for them to process your financial aid award. So you're gonna fill out the forms. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, if you're applying early action or early decision, you'll get your financial aid offers in December and regular admission, you'll get those offers in March or April. Okay, and then we're just about done, actually. Um, what, did, what do you do if you don't get enough financial aid? You appeal your financial aid offer. This is something that ev any student can do regardless of whether or not they have special circumstances. 80% of students who appeal their financial aid offers will receive some additional financial aid. There's two different types of appeals. One is special circumstances. So when you feel like, for example, if you're a senior filling out the FAFSA, you reported 2020 income information, maybe your family's 2021 income has been impacted because of COVID or something like that. 
you can report that as a special circumstance to the financial aid office, and they can actually recalculate your financial aid based on your 2021 income. So this is really important when you're ready to fill out your FAFSA. If the current year you're in, there's anything that's impacted you financially, you want to notify the financial aid office so they can recalculate because there's nowhere to put that on the FAFSA. You have to report the, the income information they're asking for. So you can appeal using special circumstances, or if that doesn't apply to you, you can just humbly ask the financial aid offices for more money um, to help you pay for your education. But there's a, a specific way to do that. There's a few paragraphs that you should write and um, some information that you should provide. But like I said, I see more than 80% of students will get additional aid by doing this. So not being aware of this, you know, you can kind of miss out on it, which is one reason why I like to make sure that every student that I, I talk to and every webinar that I do, I'm letting them know that this is an option. Okay, so with that said, I'm just going to share a little bit of information with you about how I might be able to help you in this journey when the time comes, if you need help. We'll open it up for any questions that you have after that. So I do a lot of work with families and helping them navigate the process. I actually quickly found when I started this business that um, most of the people calling me were parents of high school seniors navigating the process for the very first time. So I created a program called the Financial Aid Academy. When that time comes for you, if you think you might be interested or you wanna share it with your parents, where this is a group coaching program that runs every year from August through May. And I take students and their parents step by step through the entire year financial aid cycle. So my current program is running for high school seniors. S students can still join. There's still a good six months left in the program. Um, or, you know, for any of you that might be a senior down the road, like I said, I start, I run this program every year. So with this program, it includes a digital course, monthly roadmaps, live webinars, access to a private Facebook group, the ability to ask me unlimited questions. So just somebody there along the way to, to help you navigate and be a resource for you. And there's three different levels of service available. And these are just an idea of all the different topics that I cover. Um, which I'm not going to go over each one, one by one. If you want to learn more about it, you can just go to my website, thefafsaguru.com and check it out. I have a few standalone programs like that help students just fill out the FAFSA or, you know, a scholarships 101 course to help you learn how to effectively search for and apply for scholarships. And I also do one-on-one -on -one consultations with families and things like that. So, um, I just wanted to share that with you and let you know and make sure you have my contact information. This is my email. Feel free to send me a question. You know, if you ever, if you come, if you're doing some scholarship searching and you're not sure it's reputable, reputable or something, feel free to shoot me an email. I respond to all of my emails. Um, I'm happy to help you in any way that I can. Um, but I really, really hope you take advantage of the information in this and get started with the scholarship searching for sure. Tina, quick question. So, yeah. this, so your programs are virtual, correct? Yes, yes, they are virtual. Okay, asking yeah. for a friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I work with they, uh, they families all over the U.S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, there you go. So you guys can join wherever you are located. Yeah. All right, so we're going to go ahead and open up the floor for questions. So if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. We're going to keep it open for about 10 to 15 minutes roughly and then we'll wrap up uh so if you have a question go ahead and raise your hand or type it in the chat i, yeah, so I do heba asked a question in yeah, the chat i was getting ready to go back up to heba so heba asked if you were looking at this as a freshman do you think it will stay mostly the same so all of that content about the process for financial aid she's asking is this still relevant for her if once she becomes a senior yes it is everything will stay the same the only difference will be the fafsa will be shorter and a bit easier to fill out in about two years they're reducing it down to 36 questions from just over 100 so yes but the, they will still college will, will still require the css profile and the fafsa and scholarships Perfect. Um, Christina, you're up next. You can unmute. Hi. 
Mm-hmm. I, um, I was just wondering if um, any scholarships overlap because my, like, the state I live in, like Pennsylvania, or not Pennsylvania, like my city gives us a scholarship from attending like public school. But would that overlap with any other ones that I would apply for? No, um, that would probably just be a separate scholarship. There's a lot of local scholarships that students can look into and that happens often. So yeah, no, that's just would be a separate scholarship. And I definitely encourage you all to check with your high school guidance office first and foremost for scholarships. They have a really great resource listing too for local residents of the, the area. Okay, so I'm going to um, go in between hands. I see you, um, Shreya, you are uh, going to be right after this question in the chat. So Audrey asks, do you by chance have any advice on how to answer the uh, the why you should receive the, the scholarship question? So this is more of a spot coaching opportunity here. So how do we answer that scholarship question of why we should get the money? <laughs> why? Yeah, that's a good one. I get that. I do get, you'd be surprised. I get that question a lot. So that's one of those things where, you know, it's, it varies from organization to organization. I mean, the best advice I can give you is think outside of the box, you know, think outside of the box and maybe write something completely different than, than somebody else might, might write about or an adversity that you've overcome. Like if you've faced adversity, like scholarship organizations really like to, you know, like stories about that, stories about triumph. So I would focus on one of those two things. Awesome. Um, and Shreya, did you want to go next? Yeah, so I have a weird situation. So the university I want to go to is the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, and my dad teaches there. So I already know I'm going to get some sort of a tuition benefit because of that. Would having that benefit affect any scholarships I get? And if so, what advice do you have? Uh, It depends on what your financial need is. So any the only way scholarships would impact financial aid would be, let's go back to this, this equation. Remember when I said you take the cost of attendance minus the family ZFC, that equals your financial needs. So if you have a financial need of $25,000 and all of that financial need is getting met with need-based aid, then any outside scholarships you receive could start taking away from that other aid. So that's really the best rule of thumb to go by. It's very rare that I see it happen. So it just depends on, um, I'm not sure with the tuition benefit, some colleges, some colleges, put it into the equation a little bit differently. You know what I mean? Like they might yeah. take that tuition benefit right off the top or they might calculate it in, calculate it in as part of the equation. So it kind of depends on how they count that. But I mean, I've worked with a ton of students that have received tuition, um, you know, reduction or, or reimbursement that it really hasn't been an issue for. It's so rare in all the years that I've done this where I've seen students actually have scholarships like negatively impact them and take financial aid away. Okay, cool, thank you. You're welcome. Tina, just along that same line, I wanted to ask this question. You had Mm -hmm. mentioned in the FAFSA that the parents' uh, retirement accounts and the equity in their primary residence don't count. Do any outside scholarships that the student might have applied for and received, do they count? Like if they got a local VFW scholarship or? Not usually, only if they're they're reported and if they're required to be reported. Some scholarship organizations do send like a 1099 at the end of the year where students have to claim them on the taxes. But again, that's rare. And there's a question on the FAFSA that will say, did you receive any scholarship aid in excess not reported elsewhere on this form? You would know because you would have received like a 1099, but it's not very common. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. So we have another question. Y'all said for institutional scholarships, can you apply for a scholarship for a scholarship before you know you got into the school in the first place? 
Yes. So for outside scholarships, private scholarships, you don't have to know. You just have to make sure you're eligible to apply for the scholarship. Right. So there's going to be a criteria for each one. And it might say that you need to be a high school senior or attending college within the next year. Or it could just say a U.S. citizen that's 13 or older in that situation, then you're OK. So you just got to read the description and make sure you're eligible to apply for it. Perfect. Um, while we're waiting to see, I'm going to close this out in another uh, three minutes. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat now, as well as raising your hand. But I'm going to ask this question. So there's also something else that I wanted to highlight. So once you get, um, say, for instance, um, you just make it enough to get through your first year of school, because a lot of times you might get the funding that you need for that first year, but then what happens next year, right? Right. Uh, what are the options? Like one thing that I found out was sitting down with a financial aid counselor helped because there was they were able to increase my budget. So what are some things that they can do, you know, once they get through that first year? I was able to just by the skin on my teeth get all the money I needed for school, but what what about next year? What do you right. what advice do you have? So continue searching for scholarships. You can do that every single year that you're in college. That's one thing. Appealing your financial aid offer each and every year is another. Um, that's really going to help you. Um, those two things right there are going to help help you continue to close the gap, the financial aid gap all through college. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's awesome. Any other questions? We got two minutes on the clock. Christina, did you have another question? Your hand's still raised. No, I'm sorry. That's okay. No worries. I think I forgot to put it down. <laughs> uh, okay. I think there's two more hands. Um, any all? Uh, do you have a? Do you have any feedback? Questions? I yeah. I just had a question. Um, you said that the FAFSA it would have it would be like easier to fill out in a couple years. So, um, is it only for seniors to sign up, or can anyone sign up for FAFSA? Any yeah, you years? wouldn't. You wouldn't fill it out until you your senior year in high school. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Another question from Rachel. Should everyone appeal the financial aid offer? Yes. I, I recommend every single student file a financial aid appeal each and every year. Because it, the worst they're going to say is no. Right? That's it. Worst they yeah. can say is no, and no doesn't mean never. So Yeah. Yeah. And I, <laughs> yeah. It's worth uh, it. Christina, go ahead. You got a question? Um, does the, like, all, do all the scholarships, does it just cover tuition? Or if I want to, like, dorm or, like, the meal plan or, like, whatever, like, does it, it cover would, that as well? Yeah, it would, normally you can use them for any school-related expenses. And some scholarships, some organizations will send the scholarship directly to the school, whereas others will send the award directly to you. So it just kind of depends. It's all if it goes to the school, it's always going to pay your bill first, which always includes like your room and board and, and all of that is together on your bill. It just depends on where they send that scholarship check. But usually it's for any educational expenses. OK, we, we're wrapping up, but I see we got one more hand. Heba, go ahead. Um, let's say like you apply for a state scholarship. Mm -hmm. Like I live in Florida, for example, like the Florida Bright Future Scholarship, and like you, you're lucky enough to receive it. What if you decide to like attend an out out of school state college? So in order for some of the state scholarships, you have to attend like the in state colleges in order to receive that. So if you were to go to a college out of state, you wouldn't be able to transfer that if that applies. And I think that's the case for the Florida for the Florida, but I, I'm not sure. So you'd want to double, just double check the language of the state scholarship. In most instances, they're for specific like state colleges. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. 
Martina, I have another question, Martina. I know you want to wrap, but I have another question. No, it's is, there fine. Rule, is there a rule of thumb about how much in debt students should get from loans to go to college? For example, these engineers, yeah, when they start know. out, they're going to be making at least $60,000 a year, maybe 65 to 70 mm -hmm. by the time they graduate from college. So, right. uh, you know, should, can they amass $50,000 worth of debt, $70,000 based on their one year income? Yeah, they, you know, to 25 to $30,000 is a good average to come per out year? of college. 25,000 to 30, total. what the government will say is total. Yeah. Because if you if you come out with 25,000 a year, that's $100,000 in student and student loan debt is a lot. And, mm -hmm. you know, for every $10,000 you borrow, you can expect to pay back about $70 a month, 70 to $75 a month over a 10 year term. Mm -hmm. So the more in debt you get, you know, the more that interest really compounds. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say, you know, 30, <laughs> 30 to 40,000, like max, I, I, is where I kind of draw the line. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, but I work with families all the time that take out more and students that take out more. But I also see that other side of it when students get out and they have this significant debt and mm -hmm. it, it can be very burdensome. It, so, it so it's really important for these students to talk to their parents about what they can afford, right? Yeah. And maybe, maybe not go to the ninety thousand dollar a year yes. college yes. when they can get a really good engineering education from a thirty thousand dollar a year college. Right, right. And I think that's and even a lot of times parents, if if they haven't been to college for a long time themselves, or period, you have or a first period, grade. yeah, they mm -hmm. don't understand how the financial aid process works either. So when they get the, you know, these financial aid offers that they can kind of, it's overwhelming because they're like, oh my gosh, I never thought this would happen. You know, even if you do really great academically in school, you can still be faced with a significant financial aid gap. So it's really important to have a range of colleges and have a price in mind, but I'd be very careful about going more than like 40,000, you know, borrowing more than 10,000 a year. Total yeah, after total. four years. Speaking yeah. from experience, she is not telling a story, y'all. Do yeah. not do that because you're going to cry when you have to pay those loans. Awful. Right? It is not fun. Granted, you can you can prolong them a little bit, but you they're can, still yeah. there. They're always there. So you want to make sure you keep that debt low. I think that's and a they great go point. In, they go into your debt to income ratio. So when you get out of college and you want to like buy, you know, a car, or you want to buy a house, a house yeah. and you want to, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it really can impact you. And I would also encourage you all, like, um, add it up. Like, I think, like, if you can, even if it's, like, $500, and some people say, well, $500 is not enough. Trust me, if you get a few $500 small outside scholarships, even if it's not from the institution, it adds up. You can almost pretty much, I know people who have gone for free based on just researching those small scholarships, mid-level scholarships, yeah. not always the big ones, because I know everybody likes to do um, the uh, the Gates scholarship, which is great because we actually have some sweet nexters who have, were able to do that. But even if you can't do that, and there are just small local ones, churches give out scholarships um ask your mom and dad okay we're going to church on sunday let's see if they got some funding for co uh for college students there are we gives out scholarships we <laughs> gives out scholarships yes yeah, check with we your, your parents yeah. check with their employers too a lot of their times your parents employers yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah all of those yeah. things add up um, and don't be like me. My dad, he went to ITT and he was preaching. He said, please go to this school, like go to ITT. Like it's free if you come. And I was like, no, daddy, I want to be independent. But now that I have to pay student loans, I might have wanted to listen to my daddy <laughs> to go to ITT, which was yeah. just the local Chicago school with a great, great um, ed education that I could have received. But I think it's just getting out of your mind the thought process that the Ivy League school yeah. that's, you know, 60K a year or whatever is the better opportunity. It's great if it if it happens for you, but don't be afraid to also pad that with those local institutions. I promise you, your, your engineering degree is going to look the same and you're mm -hmm. going to definitely be happy at the end of the day that you're not in debt. You know, that's yeah. kind of one of those things you really want to think about or putting your parents in debt or having them give up their retirement because they're, you know, trying to pay for school. Like, so, mm -hmm. you know, just try to weigh those options. 
Um, yes. Oh, and Renee asked a really quick question, which I think is a great wrap up. How did you end up becoming a guru for the subject? So how did you uh, end up learning? <laughs> so good question. So I started my career in financial aid. It was my very first real job out of high school, actually working in financial aid. And then um, I started college the traditional route and I didn't do so well when I started off. I just wasn't quite ready. Um, withdrew, I worked in financial aid and then my passion was like reignited. I, um, I became a mother at a young age. So I decided, guess what? I needed to go to college if I wanted to you know, provide for my children. I went to college. Um, so I did part-time college for eight years to get my bachelor's degree while having two daughters and then had two more daughters and went on for my master's degree. And mm -hmm. all the while I worked in financial aid since 1990, I've worked at the private, uh, college, the private and public college level. And then I facilitated financial aid workshops across the state of Maine for 10 years. And I just, I've just been immersed in financial aid, um, and ended up getting my master's degree in higher education. And, and then decided seven years ago to go out on my own. And it was the best decision ever. I love it. I, um, I love doing what I do and helping families and making it less stressful for them and, and also providing affordable services, you know, so it's awesome. Great. That is awesome. Oh, yes. And again, so it's like she talks from her. I see what she uh, he was said. That is such an interesting story. I'm glad you found your passion. That's how a lot of it happens, you know, and that can definitely be applied to you all. You might find yourself starting out in one direction and end up, you know, finding your passion along the way uh, might be outreach. You never know. So I think like uh, uh, this is great. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. Um, I'm going to give out one final gift card and say this, uh, let's do this. Um, what are the three steps that you need to be doing now? What are those three steps towards financial aid that she stated that you needed to be doing now? It's three. Say them all together. I need all three together. FAFSA, CSS, scholarship. Sound right? Scholarship, well, somebody actually had it in the, the order. Hold on, let me see the one that had it in order. So we had searching for scholarships, which was the first one, mm -hmm. CSS, and then FAFSA. Is that the right, correct order? It was FAFSA, then CSS. FAFSA is CS always FAFSA. FAFSA, yeah. CSS, then outside scholarships. Heba got it right. Sorry, I've been seeing them come in. Sorry, y'all. So Heba, you got it right. So you're doubling up your money. Look at you. See, we started out talking about money and now you ended up with money. Now you are up $50. So yes, you have a gift card coming your way. Thank you guys so much for participating in this session. So um, Tina, can you put the PowerPoint right back up really quick? Because sure. I want to uh, make sure that we get uh, them the post-event survey really quick. Yep. We did questions. So go ahead and grab that QR code. Um, you'll also receive uh, a reminder email. We actually send those out at the beginning and end of the day for the session um, so that you get your information and you're like, hey, guys, don't forget <laughs> in the morning and also after the session is over with. So you'll get this um, you'll get this link as well as the link to the Google Classroom, your takeaway assignments and any other additional information to prep you for your next session. So please make sure you are checking your junk folder just in case it's going there. There, uh, but we send those out every uh, time you have a session. So make sure that you're checking those as well. Um, I'm going to give it another five seconds for you all to grab the code. Um, and you need the link in the chat. Give me one second to grab that for you. And Mark, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're asking um, for the slideshow. So is that something you can share with them? Yes. That, so the slide deck. Yeah. Yes, the slide deck will be available for you all as well. Um, I will post it in the Google Classroom. I know you guys are on top of my neck about getting all of your material. I promise you guys are going to get your material, so don't worry. Um, everything should be up um, by the time you all look uh, look in the classroom in the morning. So let me grab you that um, survey here really quick, and then I'll drop it in the chat for you. All right, there we go. 
Well, I just want to say, and also I just said to just one person, I just wanted to say this, Tina, you are amazing for you to be someone who not only had the wherewithal to say, you know what, I'm going to pick myself up by my britches very young. And I know that's an old school term, britches, but uh, <laughs> pick myself up by my britches uh, and make sure that my kids have a quality education if I got to do it. And you took the opportunity that was in front of you, which is working a job in financial aid and apply all of that knowledge, soaked it up and turned it into your own business, which is incredible to help and uh, help other families who were going through similar things, which is just quite amazing in and of itself. And I'm so happy that you were able to share all of the knowledge that you had with us this evening. So thank you so very much. I appreciate you for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move us to the next slide. And of course, you know, I always try to um, thank our sponsors really fast again. Thank you so much to our Sheila sponsors, Motorola Solution Foundation, General Motors, Amateur Radio Digital Communications, Akamai Foundation, and Turner Construction. Because you know what I always say, without them, there will be no us. Thank you so much for supporting our program. And let's move on to our Sheila news for the evening. So, you know... We are closing it out for a little while. We're shutting down shop because the holidays are approaching quickly. I know a lot of you all are in the Christmas spirit, probably are shopping right now for your gifts. Uh, so while we're doing that, we're gonna take a small, small break. So that should provide you plenty of time to catch up on those takeaway assignments after all of your finals and all of that other stuff is done. Uh, you go ahead and finish up those session assignments. Uh, then we'll meet you again here soon for our virtual networking pod on January. January 11th at 6.30 p.m. Central. On deck, we have our networking pod um, also on March 8th at 6.30 p.m. And so what is that? Um, that is the opportunity for you all to engage with your peers uh, without us involved, you know, no adults. <laughs> so you guys will have Sheila ambassadors who have volunteered to be student leaders uh, that will be moderating those sessions for you all. Uh, we have a great program that we're going to test out for that first pilot. So hopefully you guys will enjoy that. Um, and then we'll go into our final summit of the year. We are going to be done in the spring summit beginning April 11th through April 13th. So I do not want you to miss any of those sessions either. So please make sure that you are keeping that on your calendar and preparing for your graduation ceremony on April April 21st. Those are that's specific for those that have completed those assignments. As you saw, I put an exclamation point. So get those done so you can participate. Uh, if you're looking for any information, go ahead and go up to that Google Classroom and we will get you that class code if you don't have it at sweetnext.sweet.org. So just email us. Again, connect with your community in there. It's not just about me dumping all my resources in there for you. It's also about you all making sure you all are connecting with each other because you are building a network with it, with within Sheila. So make sure that you guys are talking to each other, sharing your Discord accounts and all of that. Um, if you want to be a Sheila ambassador, go ahead and share what you learn by going ahead and uh, co-moderating a session. Um, you can share a video of your thoughts on the program thus far. Um, and you also can become a social media influencer on our behalf and share some of your thoughts on there as well. Uh, all that information is also in the Google Classroom, so check it out there. If you want to ask me directly, you know I'm always available to you, and I will make sure that you get the overview as well. Um, again, thank you all so much for spending time with us. I know this has been a stretch week for us because we usually do it all in one week, so I appreciate you coming back to us this week for this session. It was awesome. Again, I look forward to seeing each and every one of you all here again January 11th. So happy holidays and goodbye. Thanks everyone. <laughs>